this king, this king of glory. Adonai, Zebaot is his name. The Lord of hosts and all around the world, they sing of his glory and fear his name. stumble he came not to condemn but to say so put your faith in him shalom everyone uh, welcome to uh, temple bet Doresh. this uh rosh hashanah yom teruah of uh, 5776 we had a wonderful or we've had a wonderful service today and uh, now the uh, lesson that I want to teach today on Rosh Hashanah and this uh, lesson comes from uh, my book that was recently published uh, last year called Book of the Shining Path and this uh, section we're going to be teaching here on Rosh Hashanah now uh, Rosh Hashanah or head of the year Feast of Trumpets is another name, Yom Teruah. But anyway, following Shavuot, we go through the, the hot days of summer, and the summer uh, in the summer it finds us in harvest. Now, why all the reflections or references, I should say, on agriculture? You have to remember that uh, the scriptures are given by inspiration to a ancient society of agrarian Jews, and so this is why we have... Uh, the so many metaphors about agriculture and you'll see begin to see deeper meanings which underlay these powerful concepts this Yom Teruah or the day of the awakening blast this calls God's people calls us to repentance and uh, other names for this uh, like I said are, are, are include uh, the Feast of Trumpets Yom Teruah and this coincides with the uh, with the, the end of the month of Elul and the beginning of Tishri, Rosh Hashanah meaning head of the year. Now, all, during uh, Passover, we have a head of the year there, and this is the uh, religious calendar that uh, was received. It starts with the with Nisan in that month during the time uh, of the coming up out of Egypt, and this here is the civil the civil year. There are several New Year's on the Jewish calendar. Another one being, uh, being uh, Tuba Shabbat or the New Year for trees. Anyway, we blow the shofar on this day, beginning our New Year. And what this does, this begins the 10 days of awe. And during this 10, 10 days of awe, we cleanse ourselves and we repent of our sin in preparation for the, for the solemn day of the year, which is Yom Kippur. Now, traditionally, the shofar blast is used as a sound of warning of imminent or imminent danger war now for us as messianus it's meant to call us to awake and get ourselves ready for the day of atonement we're given 10 days to search our hearts and to examine ourselves with thoroughness now while this uh, feast day is more solemn than other feast days it's with great joy that we remember the mercy of rabbi king messiah and that he's given us this time to repent. He warns us with the sound of the shofar that his judgment comes to those who have not repented. But to us who to take his warning seriously, there's grace upon grace. And what better is what better thing can that be? Chesed, divine chesed, divine grace, divine mercy and love. It's on this Rosh Hashanah that he judges, God judges us through his aspect of Elohim, which is his aspect of harsh judgment, whereas when Yom Kippur coming up, he judges through his aspect of yod heh vav -Heh. That's the uh, spelling of the divine sacred name of the Lord. And uh, there's grace upon grace as we repent. 
Now, it's hard not to be taken up in the theme of this this feast day is everyone, young and old alike, are encouraged, we encourage them all to bring their shofars so they can participate in this. Today, uh, Haley was blowing the shofar for our service, and she has blown the shofar many times in the past, but never for a service, and uh, congratulate her on a wonderful job that she did today. Now this is, like I was saying, this is a judgment. It's a time when the ancient Holy One, blessed be his name, judges, as I was saying before, from his aspect or sephirot of power, which power givara, another name for it is din, or complete justice. God is a balance of, uh, of uh, both justice and mercy. Givara, what is givara is a Hebrew word, and the definition of it is, Givara is the Hebrew word for judgment or severity, which also trickles down into the lower sephirot to reach Malchut and the world of action, which is our world. Other symbols and imagery associated with this sephirot are consuming fire, darkness, nights, clouds, mists, and finally, serpent. This power is necessary to maintain order in the universe. Unfortunately, the destructive force is necessary to keep order in exact punishment also contains the, 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 the uh, things of demonic evil. The Sitra Ahara, the, the, the other side. The uh, then you have Chesed. Chesed is this is mercy, grace, love, which balances out Givara. It's the Hebrew word for mercy. The right arm of God. It's a symbol. Of, uh, the right arm of God is a symbol associated with Chesed. Grace, the result of Chesed. It trickles down into reaching our world of Malkut as a doorway for God's presence in the presence in the world of action. And this world of action, this is the material world, the creation that was uh, brought about at the time of Adam and Hava. Names of God associated with Chesed are El, and Elyon, or Supreme God. Now, as you can imagine, this evokes some pretty powerful imagery. What it shows is when God judges evil, He will do it severely. I ain't, I'm not going to spend too much time on eternal judgment here, on this lesson here. But we've covered that elsewhere, and will again, but I'm not going to really go in too deep in that there on this lesson here. But leading up to Rosh Hashanah is the month of Elul. Elul is, a day, is the last day, as I was saying, on our civil calendar. And as I said before, the religious calendar starts on the first of Nisan at Passover. Now, there's a following explanation I found on Elul and Rosh Hashanah and, and the shofar. And this uh, explanation I found on this comes from, uh, from uh, www.chabad.org. This is from the Hasidic website, Chabad.org. And this is a really intriguing explanation of the month of Elul. It says, the origins of Elul as a month of special divine grace and mercy go back to the time of Moses in the year 2448 from creation. On the Gentile calendar, that's uh, 1313 before the Common Era. The first year after the Jewish people went out of Egypt. Seven weeks after the Exodus, the people of Israel received the Torah at Mount Sinai and entered into an eternal covenant with God as his chosen people. But just 40 days later, while Moses was still up on the mountain, they violated their special relationship with God by worshiping a golden calf. Upon descending from the mountain and witnessing their transgressions, Moses smashed the two stone tablets on which God had inscribed the Ten Commandments. He then returned to Mount Sinai for a second 40 days to plead with God on Israel's behalf. On the early morning of the first of Elul, Moses once again ascended Mount Sinai, taking with him the stone tablets he had hewn by divine command for God to re-inscribe the Ten Commandments. On the mountain, God allowed Moses to see, quote, my back, but not my face, close quote, which Maimonides interprets as a perception of God's reality, but not his essence. The closest any human ever came to knowing God, and taught him the secret of his 13 attributes of mercy. Exodus uh, 33, verses 18 through 34. I'm uh, 
using notes that I have for this lesson on my phone. And I need to make sure that the sound is off. It is. And uh, this, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm recording this uh, or giving this lesson from, uh, from my book, Book of the Shining Path, and this is available in a ebook format as well for uh, your Kindle readers and also for your iPhone, which is what I'm using for my notes today on my iPhone rather than go through, have to shuffle a bunch of uh, papers around here on the Bema. Anyway, what is Rosh Hashanah? It's the, the festival of Rosh Hashanah. The name means head of the year, observed for two days beginning on the first of Tishrei, the first day of the Jewish year. It's the anniversary of the creation of Adam and Chava, the first man and woman, and their first actions toward the realization of mankind's role in God's world. Rosh Hashanah thus emphasizes a special relationship between God and humanity. Our dependence upon God as our creator and sustainer and God's dependence upon us as the ones who make his presence known and felt in the world. Each year on Rosh Hashanah, all inhabitants of the world pass before God like a flock of sheep. And it is decreed in the heavenly court, who shall live and who shall die, who shall be impoverished and who shall be enriched, who shall fall and who shall rise. But this is also the day we proclaim God is king of the universe. The Kabbalists teach that the continued existence of the universe is dependent upon the renewal of a divine desire for a world when we accept God's kingship each year on Rosh Hashanah. The central observance of Rosh Hashanah is the sounding of the shofar, the ram's horn, which also represents the trumpet blast of a people's coronation of their king. The cry of the shofar is also a call to repentance, for Rosh Hashanah is also the anniversary of man's first sin and his repentance thereof, and serves as the first of the ten days of repentance, which culminate in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Another significance of the shofar is to recall the binding of Isaac, which occurred on Rosh Hashanah. And this is why the uh, during Rosh Hashanah the uh, the Torah readings for this are the Akidah, the binding of Isaac on Mount Moriah by Isaac, which we read today during service. We evoke Abraham's readiness to sacrifice his son and plead that the merit of his deed should stand by us as we pray for a year of life, health, and prosperity. Altogether, we listen to 100 shofar blasts over the course of the Rosh Hashanah service. Additional Rosh Hashanah observances include eating of a piece of apple dipped in honey to symbolize our desire for a sweet year and other special foods, symbolic of the New Year's blessings, blessing another with the words of Lashana Tova, Tikvi Vitikhatim. Vitikhatim. May you be inscribed and sealed for a good year. Now, Toshlik, a special prayer said near a body of water. Some congregations uh, take this time after services to go out to a lake or a body of water and cast bread or stones into the water, is symbolizing the casting away of our sins of the year. And it comes from, it evokes the verse, and you shall cast their sins into the depths of the sea. And as with every major Jewish holiday, after candlelighting prayers, we recite Kiddush and make a blessing on the Chala. The Chala we use this time, the, during this time of year is round Chala, which symbolizes the crowning of the Messiah. May he return to us soon. Now, uh, the uh, here. Continuing on with this article, the Ramban, Ramban on the shofar. This is from uh, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman's commentary on the Torah. And what he had to say, this is he's also known as Nachmanides. He's a contemporary of, uh, of uh, Maimonides. And they were uh, medieval rabbis from Spain. Uh, Nachmanides was more on the mystical side and mystical interpretations of the Torah whereas Maimonides was more uh, strict uh, uh, law more than mis uh, straight plain text more than just more than the mystical interpretations and my personal preference is Nachmanides and also known as the, the Ramban and what he says a memorial Teruah Teruah a blast of the ram's horn uh, Leviticus, that's Leviticus chapter 23 verse 24 
And by way of the truth, the mystic teachings of the Kabbalah, Turua is that which has stood by our fathers and us. As it is said, happy is the people that know the Turah, Psalm 89.15, similar in meaning to that which is written, Terah, the alarm of war, Jeremiah 4.19, for the eternal is a man of war. If so, it shall be a day of Terah unto you, should mean that the day that is set aside for Terah, that the world is judged according to the attributed judgment, but it will, to our relief, for we will be remembered in mercy. Similarly, a memorial of Turah, a holy convocation, Leviticus 23-24, means that there will be a remembrance of mercy in the Turah, the quavering sound. This is a quavering sound which alludes to the attribute of judgment, and therefore it's a holy convocation. It is a day of judgment in mercy. It was not necessary for Scripture to mention the shofar, i.e. that it should be a day of shofar unto you, for the shofar is already alluded to in the word day, since the word shofar is sim symbolic of mercy. It is also it is already hinted in the word day, which likewise symbolizes mercy. And Turah is on that day, and thus it is a day of judgment in mercy, not a Turah or alarm of war. It is for this reason that Scripture mentioned only the Turu the Turah Teruah, but did not mention the 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 tikiot, the accompanying plain sounds because it's already a tradition received by our rabbis which all Israel has seen as far back as Moses our teacher that each teruah the quavering sound has one plain accompanying sound before it and one after it and why should scripture mention the Torah and not mention the tikiot at all neither in connection with the new year nor the day of atonement of the jubilee year but it is because the tikiah the plain accompanying sound is the memorial and is the shofar all alluding to the attribute of mercy and the Teruah is, is, as its name indicates, a reference to the attribute of judgment. And because it, the Teruah, is wholly surrounded by mercy in accompanying plain sound before it and one after, therefore he said of those who know the Teruah that, the sound, that through righteousness they will be exalted, for you are the glory and their strength. Thus it is clear that everything depends upon repentance. But on the new year, it is concerned entirely with the attribute of justice and conducts his world by that attribute. And on the day of atonement, he is concerned entirely with the attribute of mercy. It is this that is expressed by the saying of the rabbis, the king sits upon the throne of judgment. Thus the new year is a day of judgment in mercy and the day of atonement of mercy and judgment. So anyway, that's that was what uh, uh, Nachmanides had to say concerning the uh, the sounding of the shofar. Now in Messianic Judaism, the day of Yom Teruah, which falls on Rosh Hashanah, is a day which is is prophetic of the return of our Rabbi King Messiah. We see that in it a great and heavenly shofar will sound. All will hear, and with what and what was anticipated of in the interpretations which you have seen in this book by Orthodox. Judaism, you know, their interpretations will come to pass, for it is written, and uh, look, I will tell you a secret. Not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. This is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. It says, let me start again in the scripture, look, I will tell you a secret. Not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye, the final shofar, for the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever and we too will be changed. For this material which can decay must be clothed with imperishability. This which is mortal must be clothed with immortality. When what decays puts on imperishability and what is mortal puts on immortality, then this passage in the Tanakh will be filled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Death, or it's just a death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And also in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 14, it says, Adonai will appear over them, and his arrow will flash light, like lightning. Adonai Elohim will blow the shofar and go out into the whirlwinds of the south. Now when that day comes, Rabbi King Messiah comes on that on the great and notable day of the Lord. 
the that's the greatest of all Rosh Hashanim, the greatest of all Rosh Hashanah, when he when when our Rabban Yeshua returns to uh, claim his kingdom, his physical kingdom. We already have a spiritual kingdom, and the Messiah is with us now, deep in spirit, for those who seek out to him. But the physical kingdom will return, or should I say, will be established. When the first time the Mashiach came, it came as uh, Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, a suffering Messiah. And when he returns, he will return as Moshiach ben David, the Messiah, son of David. And this is the theme of the book of Revelation, when he will be, he will be crowned king on that day, and all eyes will see him. Mark me, they, it will happen. And the, uh, the next thing I want to go into on this lesson today is... Uh, is a lesson on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the holiest day on our calendar. It's a Shabbaton. It's a, Shabbaton is a high Sabbath. It's a day of fasting and repentance. Leviticus 23, 27, and 28, the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, was the most solemn holy day by all of all the Israelite feasts and festivals occurring once a year on the 10th of Tishri, the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. That's the seventh month of the religious calendar. On that day, the high priest was to perform elaborate rituals to atone for the sins of the people. It's described in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 34. Okay, now I want to discuss here right now a lesson I had taught before on the goats of Yom Kippur. Uh, there's, uh, I won't, I don't really, uh, I won't really teach a lesson here today on this. This is kind of an addendum to uh, our Rosh Hashanah lesson, and going as we go into the ten days of awe. But I want to, I've taught this lesson before at Zion Messianic Fellowship in Austin, Texas, two years ago about the goats of Yom Kippur, and how how does these this two goats, the sacrificial goats. Of Yom Kippur, they had they had a goat of Azazel, and the uh, and the goat that was sacrificed in the temple. How does this relate to the both the true Messiah and the false Messiah? Now, the uh, the Asham offering and the sin offering, which are required in the guilt offering, are all intended by God to establish a concept of vicarious atonement. The uh, my old mentor Rabbi Yochanan Pop of uh, Beth Shalom Messianic Fellowship in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, he said one time during a lesson, he said, "These things are a shadow. If you take away the Messiah, there is no shadow." And what what uh, Rabbi Yochanan was trying to explain was that without the Messiah, none of this makes any sense. There would be no reason for all these things. Yeah, so. Yom Kippur is the most sacred day that the Bible commands us to observe. It's not a feast. It's a fast. Numbers 29.7 says, On the tenth day of the seventh month you are to have a holy convocation. You are to deny yourselves and you are not to do any kind of work. This verse establishes Yom Kippur as a fast and as a high Sabbath or a Shabbaton. A Shabbat Gadol is another word for it. A great Sabbath. It's a day when we set aside all worldly activities, a day of fasting, prayer, crying out to the Almighty God for forgiveness of all your sins, a day of atonement, for it's written, Leviticus chapter 16 verse 30 says, for on this day atonement will be made for you to purify you. You will be clean before Adonai from all your sins. Leviticus 16 31, it is a Shabbat of complete rest for you. You are to deny yourselves. This is a permanent regulation. And Leviticus 23, 26 through 27, or no, uh, 26 through 28 says, Adonai said to, to Moshe that the tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You are to have a holy convocation. You are to deny yourselves. You are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. You are not to do any kind of work on that day because it is Yom Kippur to make atonement for you before Adonai your God. 
Now the Torah lists a precise sequence of ceremonies and sacrifices that the priests of Israel were instructed the Lord to bring. Like I said, I'm only, this is only a summary of that, not a complete in-depth study of the significance of all of these things. And this can be found in, in Levit Levitica, Leviticus chapter 16. And Yom Kippur has very much to do with the Messiah, and this is because the whole concept of Yom Kippur is about vicarious atonement. Remember that word, vicarious atonement. Now, during the Middle Ages in Eastern Europe, at long after the destruction of the temple, there's a ritual, a curious ritual developed among the Jews called kaparot. This world, uh, uh, this kaparot, what it means is expiations. And it, it comes from the word kippur, and from this we get the term kippa, you know, a kippa. This is where a, a covering, the head covering we wear, okay. The ritual of Kaparot began in the 9th century by some Jewish groups who felt the need for a blood sacrifice but could not comply with the instructions recorded in the Torah due to the fact that the Beit Hamikdash, the temple, had been destroyed. And what they did, uh, they, this, uh, some would take a, uh, a rooster and sling it around their head, and then the, the women a hen, and they, they they, uh, the Torah, once get, given, had forbidden the building of high places and altars in the way that Abraham had done. And that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and 13 and 14. And so they, they did not have a temple. We, we don't have a temple to this day in order to sacrifice, uh, bring the offerings required. And if any of you think that all the sacrifices were done away with, with, uh, the single sacrifice of Rabban Yeshua, you would be mistaken in that. Read uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, the following uh, through there, which is about the millennial temple, the temple that Rabbi King Messiah will rule from when he comes to the earth. And you'll see that uh, Rav Shaul, 20 years after the temple was, dis uh, or 20 years after uh, Rabban Yeshua, had ascended uh, on high as the Ola offering into heaven, which was received by God, you find him in the temple sacrificing and doing things to be to become become a Nazir. And so, anyway, having no temple, these people uh, they the before the kaparot, this ritual that I'm talking about, they given the, the day before Yom Kippur, they would take this chicken out and sleep. Uh, and sl swing it three times over the head, and w this is a prayer that they would uh, recite while while swinging this chicken. This is my substitute, my vicarious offering, my atonement. The rooster, for women it's a hen, shall meet death, but I shall find long and pleasant life of peace. And this uh, quote comes from the, uh, the uh, September issue 2009 of Jewish Jewels. They put out by... Uh, Neil and Jamie Lash, Jewish Jewels. And the main point that we have, I have in bringing this up with Yom Kippur and all this, are the two sacrificial goats, as I was saying, the goats of Yom Kippur. These are both a symbol of true Messiah and a false Messiah, and how is this? Okay, in ancient Judaism, the rabbis developed this concept in order to, uh, okay, you have, I was speaking earlier of, uh, a Messiah son of Joseph and a Messiah son of David. And they, the rabbis developed this concept. They had a concept of Messiah that denied that Messiah was an aspect of, of a living Sephiroth, an aspect of God. And so they wondered how, they, they developed a concept in, in order to explain the scriptures. Like in one place you have the Messiah coming on a donkey, and in another place you have the Messiah coming as conquering king. And a lot of, and in uh, some places, there, there, those verses are interspersed with one another. In one place, he's a conquering king, a hero, a liberator. In the other place, he's a suffering. He's suffering, as we see in uh, in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. And so they developed this concept of a Mashiach ben Yosef, a Messiah who would suffer like like Joseph, the patriarch. And then a Messiah who would come as like as a new King David, and so they developed this idea that there would be two Messiahs coming. Now we 
as Messianic Jews understand that it's not two Messiahs coming once, but one Messiah coming twice. And Rabban Yeshua, during the first century of the Common Era, he fulfills perfectly the prophecies of the Mashiach ben Yosef, and he shall return on some great Rosh Hashanah in the future of a conquering king, King David, he'll return as. So anyway, like I said, they decided uh, that uh, there would be this, they, the rabbis thought that there would be two messiahs coming. Okay, and now the issue, the, the, uh, what we have, our conflict, you know, the concept of the messiah, the uh, we have one Messiah coming twice, and the Messiah, one Messiah is Mashiach ben Elohim, the Messiah, Son of God. Now, the issue here is not did uh, a man become God. That's impossible. That would be blasphemy. No man became God. The issue is did God become a man in the body of Rabban Yeshua, the Messiah? Yeshua means. Now, can't God, being almighty, do anything? Yes, of course he can. And just because he doesn't fit into the box that the traditional Orthodox Judaism attempts to put God in does not make it less so. So, they, God, when you when you try and put God into a box, he gets out of it. There's there's no there's you can't put him in a box. Not even the highest of heavens of heavens cannot contain God. How much less any box that you try to put him in, he can't do that. And so, God coming down and becoming a man is is what happened with the Messiah, okay? And uh, this is our concept of Messiah. Not did a man become God. Now, the two goats, okay, the goats of Yom Kippur, and the Yom Kippur sacrifice. Now, this, let me make it clear, we know that the Mashiach was uh, crucified and rose again during the Pesach time. But still, we have an analogy. He was not crucified on Yom Kippur. He was not at all. But still, we have an analogy of these goats. Now, Azazel, remember that word, Azazel. It's a Hebrew word which means scapegoat. Now, there's also a dark fallen angel by this name as well. There's a, there's a demon called Azazel, or fallen angel. He, and the root of this word includes a concept of removal. Part of the duties of the high priest of Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur involves two male goats. Lots or dice are cast to determine which one of the goats would be for Adonai and which one would be the scapegoat or Azazel. The Kohen Gadol or the high priest would tie a piece of crimson dyed wool between the horns of the scapegoat and would tie a similar piece of wool around the neck of the goat which was to be sacrificed. And this was this what this is based upon a scripture in Isaiah chapter one verse eighteen. Isaiah it says, "Come now," says Adonai. Let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. Now the high priest would then sacrifice the goat for the Lord together, gather the blood into a basin, and then enter into the holy of holies. Once inside, he would sprinkle the blood on the top of the ark of the covenant. And this is known as the mercy seat. This is where God spoke to Moses. And I believe that uh, the new Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Covenant bill will be restored and will be in the temple in the future. In fact, I believe that Israel has already found it. And I won't go into all that here, but I'm pretty sure that they have. And it's just being concealed. And when the temple does go up, now this temple, I believe the temple that will be, that, that they'll build it, will be desecrated by an anti-Messiah, possibly the Mahdi of Islam, it will possibly desecrate this temple, and the temple that that uh, Ezekiel chapter 40 begins to speak of is not this temple, but that's going to be built in the future, in the near future. That temple will be constructed by Messiah, as is taught by the sages of Israel. And so, the uh, I believe that the Ark of the Covenant will be the throne of the Messiah, at the just in the way that when Moses went into the Mishkan and spoke to God from between the cherub, not to the cherub, not to the cherubim, but between it, I believe that that mercy seat is called that, and it's going to be basically the throne of the Messiah. 
So anyway, the 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 uh, is the uh, once that uh, goat was sacrificed. Now we'll go back to the scapegoat, the goat of Azazel. The, he, what he would do, the priest would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat, and he would what he does, he confesses all the sins of the nation, the iniquities and transgressions of the people of Israel over this goat. And then this scapegoat, this Azazel goat, was handed over to a specially dedicated priest or Kohen who would lead it off into a wilderness to a cliff. When the Azazel arrived at the cliff, the Kohen removed the crimson wool from his horns and divided it in half. One piece was tied to the horns once more and the remaining half to a part of the cliff. The Azazel goat was then pushed backwards off the cliff, bearing the sins of the people as it plunged to its death. So it would it's like it's like falling into Gehenom or something. The goat would, as it falls down, it's like it's you know, it's like being cast down, you know, and the, now, this, uh, our, the, our traditions in the oral Torah tell us that the piece of crimson wool turned white each year. This, and this miracle, was, this miracle was God's way of letting us know that he had indeed forgiven the sins of the unintentional sins of the nation. Now, the Mishnah states that 40 years before the destruction of the Holy Temple, which was destroyed in the year 70 of the common era, this crimson wool stopped turning white. Not coincidentally, this is the same year that Rabban Yeshua was crucified during Pesach. Now, uh, how does uh, Yom Kippur relate to the Messiah? Now, even though, like I was saying, even though the death of Rabban Yeshua did not occur on Yom Kippur, the events of that day during Passover follow the model of the goats of Yom Kippur. And all I'm making is an analogy here of of uh, because what you have there's two messiahs on trial a false messiah a military messiah bar abba there was two yeshuas on trial that day before pontius pilate in his kangaroo court you have yeshua bar abba and Yesh and yeshua hanotri the rabbi king messiah and in a false messiah now this Yeshua Bar Abba, he was, a, he was a military leader, and he was part of a group called of the, of Zealots. The Zealots were an underground organization, and there was, within the Zealots there was a, a group called the Sicari. Now, a Sicari, a Sicari is a type of knife, and what, the, what, these, uh, what these Sicari would do, they would go into the crowd, they would go through a crowd and taking out Jews who were cooperating with the Roman occupation, you know, like Sadducees and Herodians and people like that, and take a knife and shank them in the ribs or something and kill them. And so the Jewish leadership was terrified of these people, and, and Barabbas was one of these people. And, bo and so think of them both as, as the sacrificial goats, okay? Think, think of the two goats on trial. And that... Rabban Yeshua is taken away like the sacrificial goat, and he's crucified. Okay, now this machine, this uh, this Yeshua Barabba, he is taken. Okay, now he he was released by the Romans, and basically into the wilderness because he leaves the city. So that's going out into the wilderness of Judah, and then tradition tells us later on that he was that he was killed. Okay, so it's like he's taking on, he's a, he, like he's a scapegoat, and then he's killed later on. And uh, so, and what, did, what happened during that crowd is you have, you have, which Messiah will you accept? Will you accept Yeshua HaNotzri, or shall I release unto you Yeshua Bar Abba? And of course the people... Uh, cried out, uh, uh, release, release Barabbas. Those were his supporters in the crowd out there. And interestingly enough, the, the national leadership at the time who were in terror of the Sicarii because they were collaborator, because they collaborated with Rome and the Sicarii would have killed them. But in this case, you have them coming together and, want to, and then uh, be, because the leadership wanted to end, as was prophesied, they wanted to end... Uh, Rabban Yeshua's uh, life, and so they release their own a mortal enemy instead of a beloved brother, 
releasing, they release a mortal enemy in Barabbas. Okay, and so what Messiah will you choose today? Will you accept Rabban Yeshua as your Lord and your Savior by His vicarious atonement and sacrifice for you on a stake? Or will you accept what the world wants as a Messiah? Will you accept it? Will you accept a Barabbas? Do you have Barabbas in your life? Or do you have Rabban Yeshua? Have you repented of your sins on this Rosh Hashanah today? Or Yom Kippur coming up? Have you repented of your sins? Or are you depending upon the, the way of the world? Are you dependent upon the system of Barabbas? This is a question that each and every one of us today must ask ourselves. True repentance. Repentance, how do we reflect during these days of all, how do we reflect repentance in our lives? It's how we go about our daily lives. How are you treating your fellow man and your co-workers, your colleagues, your family? Are you treating them through the aspect of, of, of uh, judgment, of sin? Are you harsh? Are you cruel? Are you causing strife? Or are you living, carrying out repentance as a daily walk, taking each thought captive, treating people with kindness and with grace and mercy? Not rolling over and being a patsy for those who treat you, treat you evil. But are you acting towards them like you have repented? This is the question. This is what you are exploring during this 10 days of awe right now. And let's, uh, so, like I was saying, the goats, these goats of Yom Kippur, Barabbas was, uh, was taken, it was released into the wilderness, and later on he was killed at some point during, during this time. He was killed with, during, during all this, and so he, uh, he, he died in the wilderness as, as, a, as an Azazel. And interestingly enough, he was he was with the power of heart. He represents the uh, power of harsh judgment, and Yeshua represents divine grace and love. Now I want to go into some terms as we're dealing with Yom Kippur here coming up. Okay, the uh, avoda. Now this uh, the Lord. Um, talk a little bit about the liturgy of Yom Kippur and Avoda. Avoda is a very significant part of the liturgy for traditional Yom Kippur service. During the Avoda, the multifaceted multi duties of the Kohen Gadol during temple times on Yom Kippur are recounted. These are, and these are found in Leviticus chapter 16. Now the Shabbaton during temple times centered on the high priest and this is an extremely demanding series of duties. He had to prepare himself for seven days, was required to stay up all night on the day before the fast. He ate very little and had to memorize every procedure in order to assure that it was properly carried out. He went into, into uh, Tevilah, or baptism, into a mikvah for, kiva, uh, for uh, tev Tevilah, ritual immersion. Everything had to be done as exactly as commanded by the Torah. Lest the Kohen Gadol be struck down by the Lord. Only he could enter the Holy of Holies. And only once a year on Yom Kippur. There was a very real fear and awe and respect for the Lord connected with Yom Kippur. Okay. And this is when, they, uh, the, the, when the sacred name of the Lord was pronounced during that time. And people would fall flat on their faces when it was pronounced. So uh, don't be taking the name of the Lord lightly. Or in vain, because it'll come back to bite you one way or the other. Okay, and tradition. Uh, it, there's a tradition that uh, they would tie a cord around around the leg of the uh, high priest in case he died in there. Then they would pull him out. That's in tradition anyway. They, I don't know how factual it is, but it is it is uh, amongst the tradition, and I would not uh, doubt it one bit. Now, Chet. This is a there's a the letter het in uh, in our Hebrew alphabet, and what this means is sin. If there were no sin, there would not be a need for either Yom Kippur 
or the Mashiach ben Yosef. However, now modern rabbinic Judaism has strayed away from the biblical and Torah concept of sin. And they believe that we're all born with a pure soul which can be kept clean by one's own determination. The Yitzher Hara, or the evil inclination, can be conquered by one's own effort and works. In spite of all the teachings of the past rabbis, modern Judaism has rejected, or some anyway, have rejected the concept of vicarious atonement. Well, that, and that's what seems strange to me because that's all what the temple is about. And even the Zohar, the great work of the Zohar, speaks of, of vicarious atonement itself in there. And uh, we know that we have fallen short. And this is the this is the meaning of chet. It's, it's sin to miss the mark. And what and then during the ritual we have the al chet prayer. This is a long prayer, a lengthy confession of our sins based upon the confession of Nehemiah. That's Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and Nehemiah chapter one six it says. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes be open so that you will listen to the prayer of your servant which I am praying before you these days, day and night, for the people of Israel, your servants, even as I confess the sins of the people of Israel that we have committed against you. Yes, I and my father's house have sinned. Okay, then the next thing is dumb blood. This is, the Dham is a Hebrew word for blood. The sacrificial system laid out by the Torah involves a large amount of blood. Even as the blood and death involved in the sacrifices are ugly, even so sin is sick and ugly. Now, during the temple times, the entire Kidron Valley, east of Jerusalem, smelled the of the stench of blood, which was continually being washed out, out of the temple precincts. Another reason for all this all for all this blood is that it's a representation of life. Sin brought death, only life can restore life. Covenants are sealed in blood. And there's something else that uh, uh, I want to bring up here in a second, but first about this, okay, this blood in the Kidron Valley. Uh, Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, soon as uh, the temple will be rebuilt, and those Jews who have been rejecting vicarious atonement are going to be in for a rude awakening. And uh, make a visit to the Temple Institute when you're in Israel and see see all the, the wonderful work that's being done to uh, to uh, restore the vessels of the temple for its time up on there. And then one thing I want to say here about about the blood. Now we know when Rabban Yeshua was crucified, or the night before he was crucified, that he walked across the Kidron, and he walked the blood road. He walked across that 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 uh, that stream, which the blood was being cleaned out of the temple. And there, you know, and he went to to uh, the place of pressing to a to a gotchmani. They call it a, to a garden where there was an olive press there, and that's where he was uh, he was praying and. And this harks back to uh, him walking the blood road. You remember in the Torah where Abraham prepares the sacrifices there and animals he cleaves in half and lays some birds out there. He keeps away the, the, the fowls of the air and then God passes between them. And this was a way in ancient times of, of, uh, of confirming a covenant and Basically, some, they would say something to the effect of, "Let what if either one of us break this covenant, let what has happened to these animals happen to me. And you remember Abraham was in a deep sleep, or trance would be like, uh, would, uh, he was in the spirit, that's a better word than trance, he was in the rakia, in, in, in the spirit, in that place between physicality and spiritual, he was in there when God, something like a burning torch, uh, Rav Yochanan had said, one, uh, Beth Shalom called it, had a lesson on this called the burning Torah torch. And so, connecting that back with, uh, with Yeshua, now see, Abraham, he didn't walk that path, he didn't walk the blood road, only God walked the blood road, and so when the covenant's broken, it requires God to die. Now how in the world do you kill God? You can't. Okay? Only if God chooses to become a man, 
and walk it. Only then can that body that he created be killed. And so this is the blood road, and you have Rabban Yeshua. I can picture his feet in the water. There actually was a bridge at that time going across there over to, over to, to uh, the Mount of Olives. But I can just, so either way he crosses over it, but I, can, I, I like to imagine him walking down through the valley and crossing through the running water that was running at the time and getting the blood on his feet and walking in the blood road in fulfillment of the, uh, of the prophecy of the, cut, of the uh, animal parts in uh, the Torah. And that's a whole other lesson. Now, uh, part of uh, Rosh Hashanah, as we've gone through today, repentance is also, repentance is a very important part of our Yom Kippur service that will be coming up. And we have Tefillah, Teshuvah, and Zidacha. Tefillah, Teshuvah, Zidacha. What this means is prayer, repentance, and charity. In Judaism, these practices have replaced the blood atonement. This happened as a result of the destruction of the temple and the scattering of the priesthood. Prayer has become the substitute for the sacrifices, and it, since it was spoken by the prophet Hoshea, and, uh, Hosea, or Hoshea 14.2 says, Let us render for bullocks the offering of our lips. And a very large part of or the body of the prayers recited for forgiveness, selachot is what those are called, are recited during the entire season of the High Holy Days. Charity, Siddhacha, has become a second substitute. For the rabbis wrote, it says in the Talmud, in uh, Tractate uh, Baba Batra 10a, it says, Charity delivers from death. Now I think the most important substitute for, for vicarious atonement is Teshuvah, repentance. It's pointed out in modern by the modern rabbinic uh, Jewish community that the Lord God spoke through his prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18, 32. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, says Adonai Elohim. So turn yourselves around and live. And that the word teshuvah means to turn around. So we have a concept here of complete turning around and going the other way. Making a U-turn, going completely away and asking for forgiveness. Repentance must precede redemption. But it's only a part of the way that God establishes atonement. And now, the next thing is psalm. Fasting is a major part of Yom Kippur. And this is what is meant by the term, afflict your soul. In uh, Vayikra, Leviticus 16 and 23. It's based on the interpretation given by the prophet Isaiah 58.3 about the humbling of the soul through fasting. Fasting on Yom Kippur is from sunset to sunset, 24 hours. Now, life trumps everything, so we would not expect someone sitting up in a hospital up here uh, trying to heal to be fasting on Yom Kippur. Someone who has a diabetic condition or something like that needs food in order to, to keep from going into diabetic shock and things like that. Orange juice, so the rule is, is, uh, is life. If you can fast completely, then do so. This is the only fast that was commanded in the scriptures. There are others, you know, like the fast of Gedaliah coming up. There are voluntary fasts. You have your own voluntary fast that you do in order to, to become closer to God. Yeshua did his own fasts as an example. But the only one that was actually commanded by the written Torah is Yom Kippur. So if you can possibly do it, do it and uh, grow closer to God by your voluntary, uh, voluntarily fasting during during this and uh, during this time coming up. Now we have uh, vedui. This is the next term I want to discuss. Vedui. It's a Hebrew word which means confession. Verbal confession is inseparable from repentance. Confession is usually done corporately by the entire congregation in, the, in our services. Although you definitely want to be confessing your own sins. Just don't depend upon you saying it as part of, the, part of the ritual liturgy in there. You have to confess and you have to mean it. This implies that the heart is, this is because the heart is responsible for sin. 
Now, why do we do this as a body of believers? And we do this because we take upon ourselves a guilt that results from being part of a sinful world. This is why they, the rabbi, the Kohen Gadol, the priest would confess over the goat, the, the, uh, the goat of Azazel, the sins of the nation, corporate, the, the entire nation. This is what the Messiah was prophesied to do. And we model this in Yom Kippur by corporately confessing our sins. And it, now, Yamim, Yamim Noraim, Noraim, Yamim Noraim. Yam is the word for day. The plur is Yamim, or days. Nora is a word which means awesome. So this term, this is where we get the term awesome days, or days of awe from. These are the days which fall between between uh, Yom between uh, uh, Yom Tirah and Yom Kippur. Now, the rabbis teach that God judges on Yom Tirah, like I've, I've said earlier at the beginning of this lesson, that God judges on on uh, through His aspect of uh, of din or, or harsh judgment, as well as mercy, of course. That uh, rabbis teach that God judges on Yom Tura whether or not a person's name will be inscribed into the Book of Life, and then they, those books are spoken of in the in in the uh, Book of Hiskalus or Revelation. And then for the next ten days, we have the opportunity to reflect upon our lives and repent of sin. So the ten days, the day, the uh, the uh, the Yamim uh, Noraim are the days of are the this days of reflection. And uh, the rabbis also teach that on Yom Kippur our fate is sealed based upon a change of heart or lack thereof. And for this reason Yom Kippur is also known as the Day of Judgment. And now the next one is, uh, is Zivachim. Sacrifices of animals during the times of the Mishkan, that's the tabernacle, and the temple are a model of vicarious atonement. What we have going on here is an exchange of life principle. The lives of these innocent animals substituted for the life of the dependent sinner. There is a divinely appointed way to God which leads to an everlasting walk with the Holy One. The sinner's way into the Holy God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov is by a substitutionary sacrifice offered through divinely appointed high priestly mediation. This results in righteousness being imparted by the Lord God to the sinner because of the death of the sinless sacrifice in place of the sinner. Now, we as Messianic Jews share this concept of Messiah with the Christians that it was Yeshua HaNatsri who fulfilled all these by his own vicarious atonement, not just for the lost sheep of Israel, but for the entire world. And he, he uh, became an Ola offering. This is an offering which ascends to heaven. And this is why... When he uh, he he goes out with the, with his Talmudim, who he had appointed as rabbis, he gave them the smicha as rabbis, the the first rabbi of the of the of the Notratim, Jewish community there, and then he ascends to heaven. It's the Ola offering. He ascends into heaven. And he becomes the Ola offering, and since it said it says he sits at the right hand of God, this means that God accepted the offering of the Ola offering for sin. Now, kind of wrapping this up, I, uh, you know, I hope this day sheds plenty of light on how God has brought about redemption for our sin-sick world, and we live by by He by offering Himself up as a as 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 the sacrifice goat of Yom Kippur in the in the form of Yeshua Hamashiach. Even though, again, He was not uh, sacrificed on Yom Kippur, but He was the uh, the uh, the Passover lamb, like uh, uh, Yochanan Hatevila, John the Baptist said, "Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world." And that's a sin offering, an Ola offering. And uh, now here's a how quote from Zohar uh, four two thirty eight b. Kind of lost my. Uh, my uh, lesson here, my, my program closed on me. I'll have to reopen it here real quick. Okay. 
one moment apologize for the delay here and, and uh, but uh, my program closed up on me okay there we go Yom Kippur we have to have at least one glitch up for the video don't we or for the lesson today let me go to the end get back to where we were on this okay coming up close Maybe paper notes would have been more advantage to, to have this happen here. But, oh well, it's all in good as we continue on our, our way here today. Okay, here we go. I was going to quote from the Zohar 4, 238b. When the judgments of the Blessed Holy One seek to scrutinize the world, eyeing it, as it is written, the eyes of the Lord range over the whole earth. That's in Zechariah 4.10. And if they find wicked ones in the generation, then the righteous one in the generation is seized for their sins. As for the wicked, the Blessed Holy One delays His anger, waiting for them to repent. And if not, no one is found to plead mercy for them. As it is written, a righteous one perishes in his righteousness. Because he is righteous, he is removed from the world. And that's Zohar 4, it's out of Parashat Bo, uh, 238 of the uh, Pritzker edition. Translated by Daniel Matt. He has done a really, really wonderful job. And that is available from Stanford University Press or anywhere online. And now the writings of the Jewish mystics speak of this theme. Not, not of an animal sacrifice, but of a righteous man making atonement for mankind. And this is the message of the Zohar. Okay? How is the Messiah, Son of God? God is so vast that you cannot comprehend them, but there are some aspects He has allowed us to be able to understand, even if in a limited way. The unknowable part we refer to as Ein Sof, or Ketir, or Crown. From this you get Bina, it's understanding, balanced by Chokmah, or wisdom. From these flow Din, or judgment, which is balanced by Chesed, or love, or divine grace. This gives rise to Tiferet, in the center, which is beauty which is Messiah. And from this come Chod, which is splendor and prophecy, which is balanced by Nitsa, or endurance. From all the above aspects of God flows Yesod, foundation, and within the foundation is Hatzadik, righteous one, which is the physically manifested Messiah. And from him flows Malchut, or kingdom, and Shekinah, or Shekinah, Glory, the feminine aspect of God. Yet God is in no way a trinity. He created a perfect body and measure of his unknowable essence dwells within that body as Rabbi, King, Messiah. Thus it is written, For it is in the Messiah that the fullness of God's nature dwells embodied, and in him you have made, are made complete. Well, that'll be... We'll conclude our lesson on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so I wish everyone out there who uh, views this video to be truly blessed and to continue to, to, uh, to study the scriptures. And I will end this with the, uh, with the ironic benediction as we close out. from her eyes in that day, in that day. Oh, when the great shofar sounds in that day, in that day. Oh, when the great shofar sounds many separates the sheep from the goats many will come from the nations bringing honor to the king of Israel the
people shall be gathered I think we'll stand upon sacred ground No matter where we've been scattered We shall be Show for a sound.